Well, good evening. We are going to look at the book of the Revelation tonight. We hope you're doing good. We're trying to do this outside. If I don't start sweating too bad, maybe we will. Uh, maybe we'll make it. But we're in the shade uh, at least. So uh, we're glad that you could be with us tonight. And we're going to try to go from uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 9 over into the first part of chapter 22 down to about verse 5. So um, we will look at that section. There's not, um, I'm not going to have a lot of great theological truths for you other than the description of the new Jerusalem, the description of the bride, the description of what we might call heaven, the description, as John MacArthur calls it, the capital city of the um, new heaven and the new earth. And that's what we're going to talk about. And we will um, read that from the scriptures and we will um, basically take it for what it says. Um, I believe that, that God could have communicated it to us in a way that we could have understand it if this is not what he meant. And so I'm going to take it that this is what he meant as we see this uh, ornate and beautiful city that will be our eternal home. So if you have your Bible and um, turn to the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think I said that wrong uh, last week or maybe the week before the revelation of John. It's Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's written by John. So, uh, Revelation chapter 21, and we will begin reading with verse 9. If I can find my place, I didn't have my place marked, so I'm having to to uh, to look as well. Revelation 21 and verse 9. And there came unto me. John has seen the. Um, the new heaven and the new earth. God's created the new heaven and the new earth. And he, we've seen um, the new Jerusalem as the bride that's coming and those who will be in heaven. And now we'll get a little more detail as we look at this um, passage. Revelation 21, verse 9. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he, and he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall there, a hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. The foundations of the wall and of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the first, third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth uh, sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoporus, the eleventh, the jacinth, and twelfth, and amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. 
and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine and in it, for the lamp, for the glory of the Lord of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever work the abomination, nor make the lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then in 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. We pray that you would help us to rightly divide it as we look to this eternal home, this new Jerusalem where we will dwell and be with you forever. We we'll thank you again for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, I don't have anything too miraculous, well, other than the scripture itself. Any great revelations are probably nothing new that you haven't heard before. Uh, it kind of scares me when I hear something new, uh, when somebody has a... Um, a new explanation for something that really doesn't need to be explained, but we see here the beauty, the brilliance of the eternal home where we will be with God forever if you know Christ as Savior. There's only one way to get to this city, and it's to know Jesus Christ as Lord. And so I want us to see in the first few verses here the uh, emergence of the city. One of the angels, uh, John tells us, it was one of the angels that uh, had one of the seven bowls or vials um, judgment that was poured out at the end of the tribulation. It's one of those angels that came and got John and he carried him away in the spirit, much like the beginning of the book of the Revelation. John said in Revelation 1, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and the Lord gave him this vision that was to come of the things that were happening now, the things that he saw, he saw Jesus, the things that are, the things in the churches, chapters 2 and 3, and then the rest of the book, the things that would shortly come to pass. And so this angel carries John away in the spirit that he can see this new Jerusalem descending out of heaven. And this is really what we think of as heaven itself, the place where we will be with God. This new Jerusalem, it will be the place, Hebrews talks about it as the, the holy Mount Zion, the new Mount Zion, the city of the living God, that heavenly Jerusalem that is occupied by angels. It's occupied by Christ. It's occupied by the, uh, well, he says, I guess the Presbyterians will be there. It says the General Assembly. That's what they call one of their meetings. And uh, all of the people from the church age, the people from the Old Testament, the angels, um, God, Jesus Christ, it says the judge of all. And the spirits of just men made perfect. What a way to describe the saved of all time. If you read the Old Testament, um, I like to read Hebrews 11 because it gives us a description of these Old Testament saints we think of, and it gives us their what they look like from God's perspective. 
because of their faith, they look like this. If you go back in Genesis and read, you'll think, who are these people? They are faulty. They make mistakes. They sin like we do. But through faith in Christ, they are the, will be in heaven, the spirits of just men made perfect, will be made complete in that day. This city descended out of heaven, it says, like a jasper stone, a really, we would think of it more as a diamond. It's clear as crystal, and this diamond descends from heaven. <coughs> and secondly, we have what I call the expanse of the city. What does it look like? What is this city? And it tells us in the next few verses the magnificence of the city. It has a wall, and within that wall it has 12 gates, three on each side. I know um, I've I like things to be designed and built um, the way they're supposed to. Um, I've worked doing some design work before and I was never good at some that I work with. Uh, there was some that I worked with that if, if you knew they designed it, it would be perfect. And God has designed this city and it will be perfect. We'll find out later on, I believe it'll be a perfect cube It'll be as, well, we say in some of our Southern Gospel songs, the city built four square because that's what the scripture says. It has a wall, it has 12 gates, three on each side, and it has 12 angels, I believe, standing there to greet us as we come into this city, this new Jerusalem, and I believe as we come and go in this city because we'll find out later that the gates don't have to be shut. Um, each gate is named for a tribe of Israel. Um, God is not finished with Israel. If you don't have Israel in your eschatology, uh, you're missing something. Um, if you don't want to be around the Jews in heaven, then you're going to miss heaven because that's where the Jews are. At least some of them will be there. Uh, not, Paul says in Romans, not everybody that's a Jew is a Jew. But those who believe in Christ are the true Israel, and they will be there. God's not through with Israel. He, in fact, he says in Jeremiah 31, and I'll give you the, the Shelby translation. <clears throat> if you can measure how high is up, or if you can measure how far is down, God says, then I'll break my promise to Israel. And, of course, the obvious answer is you can't. If you can measure the heavens, or if you can measure the foundation of the earth, then I'll cast off the seed of Israel, and obviously he won't. Israel will be in this new Jerusalem, and the, the gates of the city will have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the foundation stone, it has 12 foundation stones, probably or possibly, under the gates, these 12 different gates, but you have a foundation stone, and these stones, on these stones, have the 12 the name of the 12 apostles. And so we see both the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints that come together and because the New Testament talks about the church is built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. And so we see that foundation in the New Jerusalem. And so we see the magnificence of the city and secondly, the measurement of the city. The Bible says that John sees this angel and he has a reed in his hand. The reed is a, uh, a rule, a, a way of measuring. We have a, uh, I know when, when I used to work building houses, if, if you could get a 25 or they even came out with a 30 foot tape at one time, that was, that was what you wanted. And that was, it was something that was a certain length and you could measure with it. And well, this rod is used for that or this Read and it was used for that. Ezekiel talks about the measurement of the um, the the temple that he prophesied about that would be in the millennial kingdom, and it was measured with that measuring reed. These rods were cut typically to about ten feet, and you could measure ten feet, ten feet, ten feet, ten feet, and add it up. Um, <coughs> and he measured the length of the city and 
we don't have to do a whole lot of math because he says the length and the width and the height are all the same. Uh, some have suggested that the New Jerusalem would be a pyramid, but from those descriptions, it sounds more like a cube to me. Uh, a city, well, it calls it a city built four square. It's a giant cube, as John described it, descending out of heaven in brilliant glory from the reflected glory of God. This city has walls, it says, and I, I mismeasured this to start with or misread it. I thought it said it was 44 cubits, but the walls, it says, are 144 cubits. Well, we already know that it's, well, the, the King James, if you're reading the King James like I am, it says they measured the city and it was, it was <clears throat> I forget the exact amount of the, the furlongs, uh, I think it was 12,000, but anyway, it calculates out to be 1,500 miles. This city that John saw is 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. If you can imagine a city uh, built like that, the, the enormous size of it, the walls, as I said, are not 44 cubits, but 144 cubits, which is about 216 feet thick, not high, but thick, this amazing city of God. And in case you're wondering, well, it doesn't really mean that because that's the measurements that God gives and that's not really earthly measurements. Well, he, in verse 15, or verse 17, I think it is, it says that the, um, the measurement of, it's, the, it's in the measurement of man, which is the same as the measurement of the angel. So if it's a foot here, it's a foot there, or whatever the, the, uh, the measurement is, it's the same. Uh, this diamond-like city that is clear, as crystal that has streets made of pure gold, not the gold that we think of, that's the opaque metal, but this gold, he says, is clear as crystal. So you have the diamond-like shape or diamond-like structure on the outside, the walls of jasper, and then you have the streets. And if you can imagine, if this city is a cube, streets running horizontal and vertically, 1,500 miles in either direction from basically the tip of Maine to the tip of Florida, cubed. This city, this capital city, this city that is made to display the glory of God. And then the foundations of the city are covered with stones. And uh, you might have, <laughs> you may be able to read those better than I am. The the jasper that's clear like a diamond, the sapphire that's a bluish color, uh, chalcedony, I don't know if that's the right way to say that or not, is green like an emerald, and then an emerald is green, and the sard, uh, sardonyx is red or red and white, and the sardis stone is a fiery red, and the crystallite is a golden yellow, and the beryl is green, and the topaz is a greenish yellow, and um, the Chrysoprosis is uh, a sea green color. The jacinth is violet. Ameth amethyst is purple. And so you see these stones, these, and we talked about this morning in the message that these were the stones originally, or at least in part, that Satan had, uh, Lucifer had, the son of the morning, who was reflecting the glory of God as he sat in his presence before he rebelled. And now this city has these jewels and this diamond-like structure that reflects the glory of God. Eight of these 12 stones are also seen on the, the breastplate of the high priest that represented the 12 tribes of Israel that were kept close to his heart. And so you see this picture of an amazing diamond cube decorated with these precious colorful stones that make up this beautiful city that will light the world in the new heavens and the new earth. 
and God has always been light. In him is light, and there is no darkness at all. God spoke in the beginning in a world that was formless and void and empty. He spoke, and he said, let there be light. And there was light, and the light was good. John, in his gospel, says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John goes on to talk about John the Baptist. He was not that true light, but he came to bear witness of the light. But Jesus, he says in verse 9, was that true light that lights every man that comes into the world. Jesus would say later in John chapter 8, and verse 12, I am the light of the world. But unfortunately, when Jesus was here, Jesus told Nicodemus that famous passage that we know in uh, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that light of the world, he sent his only begotten son into the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And God didn't send his, wor his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Because, he says in verse 18, you don't have to do anything to be lost. He that believeth not, or he that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hasn't believed in the only begotten Son of God. And he says in verse 19, and this is the condemnation. This is why men are condemned, because light came into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. That light was rejected in the world, but that's the light that will be shining in the new Jerusalem. And from inside this golden, glorious, bejeweled city, the light of the world will refract and reflect through the new heavens and the new earth. When men, uh, back when I was a kid, when men went to space, for the first time and they got up and orbited the earth, it was all blackness and grayscale except that one dot that was where they had come from. I remember the, one of the astronauts talking about in uh, 1968 when they first orbited the moon and when they, that famous picture called Earthrise where they came around the backside of the moon and when they came up, the earth came up on the horizon in front of them. And all of the riots and the uh, racial tensions that were going on in 1968, and I believe it was Frank Gorman was the commander of that flight, and he said he could hold up his thumb and the earth, where all of the problems that he knew about were, would fit behind his thumb. But it was the only spot that was different colored. Everything else was gray. It was either light or dark. And that's what this city will be. This new Jerusalem will be that sparkling diamond, that color that will be the brilliance of the new heaven and the new earth. So we see the emergence of the city, the expanse of the city, and finally the experience of the city. John tells us in verse 21, there's no temple there. The temple in the Old Testament was where the people met God. God told Solomon uh, or David, he wanted him to build a temple and he would put his name in that, in that temple. And Solomon, David didn't get to, but Solomon built a temple and Solomon said, God, you're the God of heaven. I know that you can't dwell in this house that I've built because the universe can't contain you, much less this house that I've built. But you have promised to put your name here. You're, you've promised that your presence would be here. And so the presence of the temple of God represented the presence of God. God had made his presence known to people. 
uh, in Genesis, God's presence was with Adam and Eve. And with Moses, God's presence was in the tabernacle. And in the temple, when Solomon dedicated the temple, God's presence came, but Adam and Eve sinned, and Moses and the children of Israel sinned, and in the days of Eli, God's presence left the tabernacle, and Solomon dedicated the temple, and fire came down from heaven and consumed the offering that they offered, and the Bible says that God's presence was so thick there like smoke that the priests couldn't go about their normal activities because of God's presence. And it will be that kind of presence in heaven. We won't need a temple because God will be the temple. We will know him. We won't need the, the sun and the moon anymore. Isaiah prophesied about that in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 19 and 20. And he talks about that everlasting life or everlasting light that God would give and not needing the sun and the moon anymore. Back in Isaiah's gospel, he prophesies of that. Daniel said that God is light. He dwells in the light. We won't need any light because the lamb will be the light. There will be, verses 26 and 27 in chapter 21, tells us there'll be nothing bad there. Um, all the things we know of here that are bad will be banished from that place. And so we will be there in the light of God, in the presence of God, in this beautiful city. And there'll be a, there won't be any sea, the Bible says in chapter 22 and verse 1, there'll be a river of life. They are flowing from the throne of God and a tree of life for the healing of the nations that we will live there. There'll be no more curse, chapter 22 tells us, and his servants will serve him. We will be God's people and we will rule and reign with him forever. I like that um, the, the gates won't be shut. I believe in our changed supernatural bodies, as Paul says in Philippians, our bodies will be changed into a glorious body like his. We'll be able to go throughout the new heaven and the new earth. The Bible says this new Jerusalem, the gates, well, the gate is one big pearl, 1,500 miles high to cover the length of the wall. One giant pearl per gate. And then in chapter 22, it tells us the gates won't be shut because there'll be no night there. Some of you that are watching, I see a few of you that are in my age bracket. You remember when we didn't lock the door when we left the house. And I can remember at Antioch Baptist Church in Columbiana when we didn't lock the church either. Whoever got there first just walked on in because the door wasn't locked. And that's the kind of existence we will have in this new Jerusalem. There won't be anything bad there. It'll only be good there. It will be Christ there and we'll live in his presence in the light of his glory. And John saw this city descending out of heaven, this new Jerusalem that displays the glory of God and that's where we will live in his presence forever. I hope you're prepared to be a part of the bride and be in that city that you are ready to live with him forever. The way to do that is to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible says in Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. And it goes on to say in that passage in verse 13, whoever does that, Jesus Christ came to give us light and to give us eternal life so that we could live with him one day in this place that he's preparing for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you that as much as, or as little really, as we can understand this beautiful place that you've prepared for us to display your glory to 
have your people there with you. Lord, we pray that you would help us as much as we can to understand about this place, but we pray that you would help us to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because it's only through him that we can have our names written in the Lamb's book of life and that we can live with you in your presence in the light of your glory forever. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.